Okay, um, uh, let me summarize uh, the, uh, 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 a few of the examples of the uh, recent uh, researches done using the JSTAR uh, in order to um, explain to you the kind of um, the contributions that this type of data, the detailed micro-level data uh, with the panel structure uh, can uh, deliver. Um, <clears throat> So let me uh, first explain the JSTAR backgrounds very, very briefly, and then explain what kind of data um, it contains, and go through three basic examples, uh, one on labor supply and retirement behavior, and another, a second one on asset and bequests, and the third one is medical service demand and co-payment relationship. So we'll look at these three examples. The JSTAR, as um, uh, Yoshitomi-san uh, just explained, uh, started in 2005 pilot studies under then Rieti Director Yoshitomi's uh, leadership with a big methodological help from the HRS, SHARE, ELSA, and CLOSA group leaders. First wave, 2007, is based on stratified random uh, sample uh, within five municipalities, Takikawa, Sendai, Kanazawa, Adachi, and Shirakawa. And second wave, 2009, adds Naha and Tosu. And um, <clears throat> third wave, 2011, adds Chofu, Hiroshima, and Tondabayashi. And fourth wave continues with the 10 municipalities. We had great difficulties um, uh, securing funding uh, at the fourth stage, but uh, Rieti very generously funded, and that's why we could uh, continue the fourth wave. Uh, generally, first round response rate is slightly below 60%. Second round and beyond are about 80%. Response rate is the highest among the Japanese panel data. Others are about 20% on the comparable grounds. Um, but co um, comparable to the low response rate countries among share countries, much, much lower than the world record of HRS, uh, which uh, achieves first time response rate of 80% or above, and much more effort is required to improve our response rate. Here are the, here, that's the map of the 10 municipalities that um, we collect data on. Municipalities are selected based on whether we could get agreement on linking the health expenditure record when we receive signed agreement from individuals. This sampling has an advantage of having many individuals who face uniform socioeconomic environment which can be identified without asking individuals about their socioeconomic environment. Um, <clears throat> many of the research questions relate to how individuals make decisions given the environment and how environment impact individual decisions. JSTAR is, is suitable for this purpose because it con it's actually a random sample fr um, from the same environment within each municipalities. Of course, a disadvantage of the design is that nationally representative sample cannot be constructed easily. We have created weights based on published census data to construct national representative sample. So, so here is an attempt we've um, done using the crude weights about three aspects we looked at, um, household deposits, household uh, uh, wage and salaries of household, and consumption. So let me uh, look at these three things uh, in turn. So <clears throat> JSTAR 2007 low column, and J there's uh, JSTAR 2007 upper column. When individuals don't t uh, tell us the exact uh, number, we ask, we insist that they give us some ballpark figure, um, lower bound and upper bound, by sequentially asking them uh, questions whether it's above certain number or not, okay? And so uh, some, some person, we only have lower bound and upper bound, okay? Not just the exact number. So if we use the lower bound for uh, such persons and use the exact number, we con uh, that's the column that, that we uh, construct in the JSTAR 2007 lower column, and upper is, is using the upper bound. And 
and uh, the NSFIE is the National Survey of Family Income and Expenditure, um, and for age 50 to 59 and 60 to 69, I think um, for 50 and 59, it's exactly be between these lower and upper bound with, with appropriate weights. And um, <clears throat> our total household deposit is, is slightly lower than the uh, uh, NS NSFIE data, but uh, it's close, fairly close. And <clears throat> wages and salaries of household head, um, we just use the exact numbers. And with these columns, you can see that it's pretty, line, they, they line up. Um, even though we, our data contains just 10 municipalities, by appropriately weighting these data, we could construct the population uh, fairly accurately. And the same for, is true for household consumption uh, data. Okay, lower bound and upper bound contains mostly the NSFIE uh, nationally representative data. Now, this is using uh, published um, uh, information, like census tract level uh, data. But if we can go back to the individual level data, I'm, I'm confident that we can improve this uh, match. And moreover, if we discover that there, is, there are some cells that our data do not contain, that in itself tells us where we should sample. Okay, so, so we know, for example, we don't have many uh, fishermen data in our, in our sample because of the 10 municipalities' locations. And so if, we, if that fisherman's behavior is very different, then we should contain fishermen uh, information, uh, data, and, and we should collect them in, uh, going through different uh, municipalities. And that's how uh, we could improve our uh, uh, data and strategically. And that's, um, so this, this effort, uh, we, we would continue, and, and, um, uh, and I'm confident that we could improve our um, national representativeness even further. So let me um, move on to the content of the JSTAR. Uh, questionnaire largely designed after share, so mostly common across HRS family surveys. And there are um, eight sections. Individual A contains individual characteristics and family. B contains cognitive ability and, and some other aspects. And C contains uh, information about work. D contains health information. E is income and consumption uh, slash durables. F is about grip strength. And G is housing and asset. H is medical treatments and care service usages. Okay. So let me uh, go into uh, further uh, individual characteristic and family. Section A contains age, gender, marital status, education level, uh, including spouse's education, and family composition and age, education level, and economic dependency of children, whether parents are alive and age, and the need for caring if they are alive, frequency of contacts, whether they can share the care with others, uh, and so on. And section B, cognitive ability and others, contain ward recall. So we give them 10 wards and ask them to uh, 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 tell us w what they are after a minute or so. And then we do this uh, again uh, uh, after s s finishing up certain sections. We, 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 go, we ask them again. And, um, then repeated subtraction is, is minus seven from 100, and then they, we ask them to repeat. And then percentage calculation and measurement of discount factor. So we ask them uh, you know, th whether they value $100 from uh, three years later versus uh, $100, $100 today versus, let's say, $110 three years from now, and so on. And compare, ask them to compare and, and choose, and measurement of risk aversion and so on. So we, uh, that's that's kind of information is in section B and about work. 
self and spouse's work status, including hours worked and earnings, and content of work, job satisfaction, existence of retirement age, expected retirement age, if not retired already, and if retired, whether job was offered for rehiring upon retirement, and so on. So this is kind of detailed um, <clears throat> information about work is uh, contained. And health, self and spouses, self-assessed health, problems with eyesight, hearing, chewing strength, and um, activity of daily living, and instrumental activity of daily living. Um, ADL is whether one can eat on his own, her own, uh, or take a bath, change clothes, some basic uh, activities. And instrumental activity of daily living is whether one can go out using public transportation, make doctor appointments, and so on. So we ask these questions. These are common across uh, other HRS type surveys. An income and asset, income from various sources, including pension, expected pension amount and sources, if not yet receiving pension, consumption, durable good expenditure, and their, their uh, re replacement frequencies for a major items such as automobiles. And housing and asset, housing space and its value, amount of debt, amount of different assets, economic value of e uh, business if self-employed, past and expected amount of inheritances and bequests, and self-assessed survival probability from ages uh, 75 to 120. Okay. And about medical and care service usage, uh, the data contains diagnosis, experience of 20 main diseases, timing, treatment status, types of treatments, and expenditure and for each of these 20 items. And then whether received health checkup, dentist usage, whether care needs are officially assessed, timing and its level, the reason for the care needs, care service usage and expenditures. And care given by family and acquaintances, care given to family members. These are all contained in our, in our JSTAR data. There are some different aspects of JSTAR from other HRS type surveys and, and uh, one aspect is food intake. And we measure food intake uh, using a questionnaire validated in Japan. For those who gave us a permission, we can link the administrative record of their health nursing care usage. Uh, uh, that's, that's another um, aspect that our data has. And that's um, the advantage of going through municipalities as we can uh, request this kind of information uh, um, directly through the municipalities. And also, for those who gave us permission, we can link the health examination, height, weight, eyesight, hearing, blood pressure, urine analysis, stool test, x-ray, and various blood tests record uh, with our data. So we can link um, these uh, socioeconomic family uh, background data with this kind of data and the food data. Okay, so let me um, <clears throat> give you some examples of um, uh, researches carried out using JSTAR. Um, three implications of aging often discussed are labor shortage, deterioration of the balance on the pay-as-you-go pension system, and increase in health and care service expenditures. So we'll examine issues related to these in, uh, in turn. The first about labor supply, among the developed countries, Japanese elderly men and women tend to remain in the labor market longer. Finding out how this is possible may be useful for other countries. And this is a graph I showed um, like uh, three years ago uh, when there was a conference, but let me just uh, reuse them. And red line is Japan, and as you can see, labor force participation Above, above 60 uh, is still very much higher than other uh, OECD countries. And compared with 1980, Japan was 65, and it's, it's dropping to 65 to 49 at 65, but other countries is much, much lower. So although 
Japanese labor force participation at 65 to 69 is much lower compared to 27 years ago. It's still much higher than other countries. And so that um, <clears throat> we need to find out why that's so. Women's labor force participation up to 50s is, is not very high, but above 65, it's very high. And that's uh, something uh, that we, 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 we wish to find out uh, the reasons. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, with Shimizu san we examined the labor supply behavior using JSTAR data. The one big advantage of JSTAR, as, as we just saw, is that it contains health-related variables, family-related variables, as well as socioeconomic background. And so we can, we can assess these three different aspects, contribution to uh, retirement. So this is the graph for males. I'm afraid uh, this is very vague. You um, can't see very, very much. But left hand is a graph for retirement behavior uh, for, uh, for people who are very well off in terms of, of family background, uh, socioeconomic background, and, um, and, uh, and, and health uh, aspect. The right is, uh, is, is, our, our, is a group of, group of people who are disadvantaged in, in all three aspects. Okay? And um, <clears throat> if you compare left-hand side and uh, right-hand side, the, and this is the horizontal axis is the amount hours worked uh, in, in 2007, and this is the vertical axis is whether they are retired or not. Okay? And so if, if people are not working zero hours, in 2007, a very high pro fraction of people are retired uh, in two years later. So this is the aspect that we can uh, only measure using the panel data. Okay, because we, have, we, we follow these people, the same group of people, we can look at the fraction of people, of those people who are not working, how many are retired two years later. If people are working uh, zero to 30 hours, so working some, but less than 30 hours, the, the retirement probability is much lower. Okay? And if people are working uh, 30 hours to 40 hours per week, uh, this is the retirement probability, and so on. If people are working longer, the retirement probability is low, is, is what you can see. But compared, and compared the same age, this is this the the fat red line is 50 to 59. What you can see is that this group is, is higher. Okay, so so and the same is true for pink line, which is corresponds to 70 to 74, and also for um, a 60 to 64. It's this left hand side is higher. So that means if if ever in all three aspects, if they are uh, better well off then they, ha they have higher chance of retirement, okay? But I'm afraid it's very hard to see, but 65 to 69 group, it's opposite. Can you see? Maybe not. Okay, it's, it's around here on this graph, and it's like here. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a bad graph. But, but it, um, you, you need to believe me <laughs> to, okay. to see. But, uh, but, but actually, um, so if you're not well off, you don't have, um, uh, uh, you, you, you're less likely to be working. You're, you're, you're more likely to be retired if, if you're not well off. Okay, so that's the, um, I'm afraid it's the same for a woman. <laughs> okay, for a woman, um, <clears throat> The same is true for 50 to 59 and 70 to 74. There, if, if you're well off, you're, you're more likely to be retired two years later. Okay? But for 60 to 69, for this group and this group, it's actually uh, green, you can see. Uh, 
retirement probability is higher if you're not well off in all these three aspects. Okay, so, so above 60, it's, it's, I, I think the interpretation is that they're not offered job opportunities because they're, they're more, uh, they're, they should be more wanting to work, but I think that they're not given the, the chance of, of working. Okay, so that's, so, uh, <clears throat> so main findings are that like Banks and Smith, we find that retirement is a process rather than an event. So, so if you go back, um, <clears throat> you know, the probability, <coughs> It, it looks like this indicates that people are going to reduce the, uh, the hours worked over time, and then they finally retire. Although, you know, we, we need to look at more, a longer panel to really confirm this. And the process differ mainly due to family factor for men and socioeconomic factor for women. I didn't show you this, but, uh, but the main reason for shifting for male is, is a family factor. And the main reason for women is the socioeconomic factor. For men, better indices lead to higher probability of retirement at all ages except 65 to 69. For women, better indices lead to higher probability of retirement at ages 50 to 59 and 70 to 74. But for 60 to 69, they lead to lower probability of retirement. <clears throat> so when the pension eligibility age is raised above 65, those who currently choose to retire are likely to require to work. For both men and women, individuals with lower indice indicators in all three aspects are more likely to be affected by this policy because they're more likely to have chosen to retire. So that's, that's the aspect that, that uh, we find. Another work um, <clears throat> done is by Usui-san and Shimizu-san and Oshio-san in 2014 they attempt to quantify work capacity of older adults in Japan using ZSTAR. They first examined the relationship between detailed health statuses and work statuses, full-time, part-time, retired, using individuals in their 50s. They then used the health statuses of individuals in their 60s and the first half of 70s uh, using the Cutler, Mira, and Richards Shubik uh, type analysis. This is their result. <clears throat> So this, is the, this column is the actual uh, retired percentage in 60 to 64. For males, it's 20.5% uh, retire. And part-time in this age group is 17.6% and 62% uh, 62 uh, is full-time work. But if you use the uh, 50s and match their health statuses, the retirement, predicted retirement for, for this group is 4.7%, okay? And then full-time jumps up from 62% to uh, 80, predicted full-time is 88.2%, so much higher. And the biggest jump is on 65 to 69, okay? The, the current full-time is 29.3%, but in terms of health, just match the health content, they're predicted to work 84.4%. So, so this means there's a huge potential for uh, labor supply increase if, if health is the only factor that, that's affecting the retirement, I mean, retirement decisions or working uh, hours decisions. For women, the effect is not as stark. But I, I believe that, that there's a, there, there's a reason um, <clears throat> for this. When the pension eligibility age is raised above 65, whether it is feasible for many to continue to work is an important issue. This paper gets at this important question. Using those in their 50s may not cleanly pick up feasibility aspect of working for women, but for men it may be uh, good. And given that women are healthier, and namely live longer, uh, perhaps one can use the results for men as a lower bound for women. And there are many socioeconomic reasons why women uh, is um, uh, not working in their 50s currently. So uh, men may be a better uh, indicator. 
given that we cannot force people to work if they cannot work, this raises an issue of how to design a pension system under which the pension eligibility age is self-selected. We probably want the penalty of early take-up to depend on family, health, and socioeconomic conditions, given these uh, two types of uh, uh, researches. Currently, it's just uh, uh, age that depends. And this is the <clears throat> expected net life uh, time wealth by cohort. So it's the second uh, type of uh, issues that, that wealth. So above 70, if you if we use JSTAR, there's net wealth negative. There's a 12% of people who with, with a negative net wealth, lifetime net wealth. So it's um, it's a huge fraction, and and it's. For 50 to 59 group, it's much higher even. So, so this would be a, a, a really um, <clears throat> serious issue that I think we need to be uh, thinking about. And if you look at the importance of uh, pension, it tell, this graph tells us the importance of uh, pension within this at net asset. And um, this is the lifetime total asset excluding pension, and this is the lifetime uh, total asset. So the difference between these, these two graphs is the, is the contribution of pension, which, is, which contributes in age different cohorts, it's about 50%. So raising the eligibility age from 65 by one year amount to requiring individuals to save up the equivalent of 50% of annual expenditure if the eligibility age is raised by one year. And this percentage, of course, you know, uh, is the importance of, of, of pension as a fraction of, of your asset is, is different depending on the household type. So how much you need to additionally save up uh, is different uh, depending on the house, household types. The bequest is a source of relief. Um, can bequest be a source of relief from a large financial pressure aging places on pay-as-you-go retirement system? To answer this question, uh, Sanchez, Romero, Ogawa, and Matsukura use computable general equilibrium model along with JSTAR as a source to calibrate their model, among other data sources, to obtain the following result. So this is the um, annual bequest flow as a fraction of output Japan from 1950 to 2050, we're here, we're about like 60%, uh, 6 is the bequest as a fraction of G GDP per year. And in 2015, it's, it's, go it's going up close to 9%, okay? And if you go farther, according to, this is, this is the figure I just showed, showed you, with more optimistic figure, with higher bequest motives, it's this graph, and with a less uh, bequest motives, it's, it's this graph, okay? And, um, <clears throat> and main, main driver of the increase is the increase in the deaths of wealthy individuals as a fraction of total population, because this is the, uh, in some sense, benefit of aging, aging society. They, they have more elderly people with much wealth who are dying and that they leave bequest. Okay, so that's the positive side. The higher increase corresponds to a model with higher bequest motives. So we can expect to have a modest relief for some time to come in the next 50 years to 60 years. Okay. In 2014, the fraction is 6.2%. Compare this with medical expenditure uh, uh, as a fraction of GDP, 10.3%, old age pension uh, is 11.2%. So this is not a small fraction of, um, compared to other figures. How, how much of this translates to tax revenue depends on the tax system and how the wealth distribution is across individuals. So that's another micro uh, level information that we need to um, squeeze from JSTAR. Uh, medical uh, <clears throat> service demand and copayment, Ibuka examines the impact of a change in copayment uh, from 30% to 10% when one becomes 70 on the medical service demand by types of medical conditions using the type of analysis that Shigeoka-san uh, conducted. And Ibuka finds that the reduction in the copayment leads to increase in some services usage for some specific illnesses. Joint disease um, three times 
uh, per month, liver diseases two times per month, increase in service usage, ear diseases 1.3 times a uh, month per month, and diabetes 0.53 times, and so on. And Ibuka also shows that the extent of the increase differ depending on patient's income. And sometimes an increase in comment is suggested as a way to contain medical expenditure. And the result shows that for these diseases, there will be a decrease in the medical service demand. There should be some discussion with the medical profession whether the increases in these specific cases should lead to welfare improvement. And obviously, policy implications will be different depending on the outcome of the discussion. And so we need to make this discussion. In summary, these researches illustrate how JSTAR data have been used. Of course, all of these research results are tentative, and many more works need to be done. But I believe these studies give us some specific images about how different aspects of social security policies should take shape. Together, they help us go beyond concerns merely about the budgetary implication of aging society and to actually begin to think how we should face the aging society with better ideas about how we behave and react to policies. Uh, and, uh, thank you very much. And this is the list of JSTAR members. I, it, was, it became too small to read. <laughs> thank you very much.